Hey, hey, welcome and welcome to the third lecture in the Design of Embedded and Intelligent Systems course. Today, uh, we'll talk about design. So last class, we talked about how you can gather requirements, and now we'll talk about how you can uh, put those together to make a plan for your system. Um, basically, this involves mapping your goals to the approach that you're going to use. And one of the first things that you want to do, of course, is to find out what approaches exist. To do that, you can uh, do a literature survey. You can look at your data and try to see what's the best way to deal with it. Uh, and once you've done that, uh, then the next step is to um, represent uh, this knowledge clearly so that you can realize a system and then progressively refine it. To do that, uh, I think we want the representation to be three things. We want it to be unambiguous, easy to understand, and specific. Uh, to make it unambiguous, you can use computational logic. To make it easy to understand, you can use visualizations and diagrams. And to make your design specific, um, there tends to be a trend where we talk about things at sort of a higher level first, a more general level first, and then we go progressively down into details when you're, so in your system architecture, which is a, a top level uh, way to look at things where you're going to specify the structure and behavior of the main components of your system, how they relate to one another, non-functional requirements, views and stuff like that. Uh, after you do that, then you tend to describe each component, each module or submodule, uh, and this can contain implementation details. And the result of this can be some type of report, uh, specification, design brief, or such. Uh, this class, we're going to focus on the top two things, which is uh, logic, computational logic, and diagrams. First logic, uh, why do we care about this? It's uh, a way to write ideas concisely, avoiding ambiguities. So I think you've all probably taken uh, computer science and computational logic before, so these symbols won't seem too strange to you. Um, uh, we also look at truth tables. Um, and uh, Boolean logic. So Boolean logic, we, we deal with uh, statements that can be either true or false, T or F, or one or zero. We can say one is true, zero is false. Uh, so here uh, on the top right, you see an example of a truth table uh, where we're looking at A and B. Um, so an example of a logical statement can look like this. If a student waves at Baxter, then Baxter waves to a student. Who is Baxter? Baxter is one of the robots that I use a lot. Um, then uh, you notice in this chart that we have uh, propositions and predicates, but uh, this is sort of uh, um, important because uh, this comes about in uh, different kinds of logic. So we have propositional logic where we, we, we deal with propositions. Uh, this can be something like Baxter is a robot and you can represent that with X. Um, and we also then uh, look at predicates in first order logic. So a predicate can look like this uh, or uh, something like that, predicates and relations. Um, and here we use uh, also notation to talk about, does this apply to all things or does this, uh, is there something uh, that exists where this applies? And that's represented in these two um, rows here. Now, second order logic, we also talk about belonging and sets. So uh, there's sort of a different uh, orders of logic that you can think about. Uh, here I've talked about some of the more common logical uh, concepts like not, and, or, and exclusive, or. Um, so in, in logic notation, usually we use this kind of symbol. 
in programming, you might use different symbols to mean uh, the same thing, like uh, for Java, for example. And when you're uh, making uh, logic uh, gate diagrams, then you want to use uh, this kind of notation for logic gates. Um, in computational logic, there are some well-known rules or laws or concepts, uh, like for example, modus ponens, which is described over here, and de Morgan's laws, which are shown here. Uh, and logic can also be complicated. So, I mean, you can have different concepts like uh, an active negation versus passive negation. For example, if you say that X is the statement that means uh, someone believes there is a God, then you could say that the active negation of that statement X would be someone believes there is no God. Uh, but then we also have a passive negation, which is it's not the case that somebody believes there is a God. Uh, and the active negation in this case could be uh, related to atheism, whereas the passive negation would be agnosticism. So there is sort of a difference between them. Uh, let's have a little exercise. So please pause the video if you'd like to give these three questions a try. Okay, uh, I assumed you've paused the video if you wanted to. Uh, let's look at question one, uh, make the truth table for OR. Uh, so you can see that OR is true for everything unless both B A and B are false. Um, so to, if you're not familiar with computational logic, this might sound a little bit uh, confusing to you because you might think that um, or should be false if if both of them are true. It should just be one or the other, uh, which we often think about when we use or in English. Uh, but this is actually represented in logic as something different. It's we use the exclusive or to represent that idea. Okay, second question. Let's write a few statements using logic symbols. So I've gone ahead and done that, and there's different ways to write this type of thing, but you can see that the first question is an example of modus ponens, and the second question is an example of de Morgan's laws. Uh, third question, logic gates, let's draw this thing. Uh, well, what is this thing? This is not A or B, so uh, we can use a nor gate. And if you didn't think about that, it's perfectly fine to just use an OR gate and then invert it uh, using an OR gate. Okay, uh, then we go to diagrams. So uh, I mentioned the system architecture uh, a little while back, and there's different ways to um, depict architectures in a bit of a more formal way. There's uh, architecture definition languages, but it's often the case that people just use an informal strategy of using boxes and lines. So boxes are your components and you connect them with lines. Uh, and this is sort of a, a nice, simple, common way to visualize stuff. When you do so, you remove a lot of words and things can become a little bit easier to understand. Uh, flow charts are also a very common kind of diagram. Uh, so we use them for the same reason because they're very common. Everybody is knows them and has seen them before. Here are boxes represent actions, diamonds are conditions. So here, if, uh, if we check if a student waves at Baxter, uh, if yes, then Baxter will wave back. If not, then we go back and loop again, check again. State machines. Uh, so I think this is sort of a very uh, fundamental and uh, important thing to look at a little bit if you're writing programs for robots. Um, because uh, this is probably the simplest way that you can program a robot. You can imagine that your robot has some type of state. Maybe it's patrolling, maybe it's idling, whatever. And that state will change when something happens. So uh, for example, the robot can be idling until it sees your face and then it turns on and says, hello. Um, but this concept of having states and then some type of uh, transition uh, to diff other states is really uh, key, I think. And we, we also use it in general computer science for software complexity analysis and stuff like that. So what is this? Uh, we have states represented here by circles and transitions represented by arrows. 
The start state is indicated by this incoming arrow here. So our start state here is A. The end state is shown with a double circle. So our end state here is B. And an important concept when you're thinking about state machines is if it's deterministic or non-deterministic. Um, so in a deterministic machine, uh, the output will always be the same when you get some, when you have some state and input pair. Uh, Non-deterministic, you will go uh, and use the transition that uh, is the most likely to bring you to the end state. Um, so I'll, I'll give an example of this. Here on the left, we have a deterministic state machine. Here on the right, we have a non-deterministic state machine. Um, so you can see here, uh, if you have a, on the right, if you have a, a string of one, uh, one, one, uh, then uh, if this were deterministic, uh, you, you might go here with one and then you'd go back with another one. Uh, and that wouldn't be very good. You, you wouldn't finish. But uh, since it is non-deterministic, you can loop once and then go over to end here. Um, so uh, this is also just a very simple example where I'm using zero and one as uh, the, the input that is going to get your robot to change states. And states are just called A and B. But in your own real application, you have, of course, more complicated states and complicated inputs. For this simple case, uh, I'm showing strings in this kind of uh, expression. Uh, this means that you're going to get a zero, no, no matter what, you'll have a zero. And then any number of ones after that, that can be a zero to n. Uh, here is another example of a diagram that I use quite a bit when I'm um, making different processes that should communicate with one another. You can see again, if a student, a student will wave to Baxter and then Baxter after that will wave back. Entity relationship diagram. This is useful if you're making a database. So here you have N students who wave at one Baxter who has a red head. Unified modeling language. Uh, there's many kinds of diagrams that are comprised by a UML. Uh, the proposed benefit is that it's a standard. However, some people have mentioned criticisms that it's extra work, that it might be uh, too complicated or hard to understand. Uh, one kind of diagram that might be useful for you is the class diagram, which is uh, possibly aligned with object-oriented programming. And what is it? It's uh, a way to depict attributes, scopes, and relationships. So here you have attributes like a Swedish person number, uh, the scope is public, uh, and you have a relationship, in one of these relationships, again, with N students to one backstrip. Use case diagrams are also quite common. You might see these. Um, process models. This is an example of a process model called a Petri net, um, where the circles are called places, the rectangles are called transitions, and you have arcs connecting these. Uh, and why are, are, is this sort of interesting? Well, because you can model workflows in distributed systems and it's mathematically defined, which uh, makes it kind of interesting. So here, if you have this example, you've got this arc with two, so uh, this will be reduced by two, this will be reduced by one, and then you'll get four over here. And there's many, many other kinds of diagrams that people use, but this is just some of that. Okay, let's have a, little, a few little quizzes. Uh, please pause the video if you want to try this by yourself and then resume later when you've got an answer. Okay, let's go for it. I assume you've paused if you wanted to. So what do we have here? Uh, well, looking from the top, we've got not A and B, or A and not B. So uh, you'll, you might recognize that then as being exclusive or, that would be A. And if you don't recognize it, you can just write out a truth table. You can just say, what happens when A is zero, B is zero, what happens when A is one, etc. And you'll see that it'll be the same truth table as X or, exclusive or. State machines. Which strings are accepted by the machines below? Uh, so let's look uh, one by one. 
uh, pause the video if you want to attempt uh, to answer it yourself. Otherwise, we proceed. Okay, let's go for it. Uh, zero, zero. So we start in state A, zero, zero. We're in the end state, so yes, zero, zero is accepted. Zero, one, no, not accepted, not in the end state. One, zero, we loop here, go over here, end state, yes. One, one, uh, we loop here, one, we loop again, one, no, we're not in the end state. So there's only two strings, uh, two nibbles that are accepted by that thing. And then on the right, we try this again. So zero, zero, yes, accepted. Zero, one, no, not accepted. Uh, because there's no way to loop on one there. There's no loop on zero here. Uh, one, zero, yes, we can loop here on one and go over on zero. Uh, or we could go over here on one and then loop on zero. And then one, 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 one. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Uh, one, we loop here and then we go over here on one and that's accepted. So uh, the non-deterministic state machine on the right accepts three strings. Let's look at a little bit more of a complicated problem. So here you see we have any number of pairs of zeros followed by a one, followed by any number of pairs of ones. Let's look at the simplest uh, proposed answer, that's C. So now uh, let's say if we have zero, zero here at the start, uh, we can loop. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, but what happens if we have uh, zero, one? This thing can loop on zero and then go to one, but that's not represented in this expression. So this accepts other strings that aren't defined here. So C is wrong, but let's try A as well. So we try again this example that we found, zero, one. We go here, zero, and then one. Yes, this accepts zero, one, but this is zero, one is not defined by this statement. So we try this one over here. And you can see probably, uh, I think that this will accept any number of pairs of zeros, followed by one has to come. If one doesn't come, we're not in the end state and then any number of pairs of ones. So B is our answer. Thank you for listening. Um, and for those who are interested, you can stick around and I will talk a little bit about Swedish food. Um, so uh, these are some of the foods that I think are a little bit interesting in Sweden. Uh, lingonberries are like cranberries a little bit uh, in taste, but uh, I'd say they're, they're a bit smaller and sweeter and uh, I drink the juice quite a lot. Uh, Eurotrun is a, called a cloudberry in English, I think, and it's uh, found in northern Sweden. Uh, so some Swedish people really like this, and they told me that they need sometimes they need to have their Eurotrun. Uh, of course, meatballs are well known uh, outside of Sweden. Uh, for German-speaking people, you might be a little bit surprised if you see. Uh, semla being sold, that it's not the same thing as a semel. Uh, this is a, sort of a, a sweet dessert that you eat. Uh, Lussekat uh, over here has a taste of saffron. Uh, Smurgos torta is uh, something that you will maybe see when somebody has a PhD or licentiate defense. Uh, then uh, often this, this will be uh, will, be placed out for everybody to have a piece to celebrate. Uh, Lutfisk, uh, it's bleached fish, cod, I think, uh, and surströming is a very stinky, rotten, fermented fish. This stuff is really crazy. I would not open it indoors. Uh, when I tried to open it outdoors, uh, outside the university, uh, the flies of the region swarmed there was maybe hundreds of flies that came out immediately as soon as this thing opened, uh, which I hope gives you some indication of the smell and taste. Uh, okay, uh, thanks. That's done for today then. See you next time.